All right. Well, folks, I'm here with Dr. Vicki Grove, my erstwhile colleague at the uh, Department of uh, Germanic and Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, Dr. Grove is an extremely celebrated faculty member here at CU um, and uh, also quite a uh, uh, quite an authority on folklore, both in uh, Slavic and Nordic regions, and uh, recently done a lot of work on some heroic literature, right? Got a new class you're working on. It's running, it hasn't enrolled. <laughs> but another well, time, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's uh, let's let's get going. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and about what uh, what your your work has been so far? What brought you into uh, kind of the Slavic Nordic interface? All right. Yes, I'd be happy to. So, oh, I've been on campus um, for my whole adult life and I, I came here um, for graduate school to, school to study um, 19th century Russian literature and that was really my primary field particularly uh, Dostoevsky uh, but my interest in Dostoevsky is in part uh, just his own interest and use of folklore in his literature and probably most people are familiar with works like Crime and Punishment and and Brother Shramazov, but but his earlier works were very much influenced by some German Romantic writers uh, like E.T.A. Hoffman, um, who incorporated the supernatural, and, and he did also in his early and, and vastly less popular works than his later novels. Um, but even in a work like Crime and Punishment, there's a significant amount of folklore there. And when I've taught that novel, um, I've always tried to emphasize that a little bit. Um, just, you know, for, for example, I don't, I'm assuming maybe some of you are familiar with, with the novel, but, but there is a rather uh, wicked, very interesting character named Svidrilek Gailov, who at one point describes the protagonist, um, Raskolnikov, uh, his version of, of eternity, and, and he says it's like a Russian bathhouse. And, and, and Raskolnikov is just horrified by that and says, Sur surely you can come up with something something better than that. And and you might wonder like, what's so wrong with the Russian bathhouse. But but when you know something about the folklore behind that space, uh, which is a liminal space in, hmm. in Russian folk belief, and you understand that when people use the bathhouse, it was believed that they were just getting physically clean, but just like, all, you know, evil, everything nasty was, you know, their sinful nature was being washed away under the floorboards. And so these oh. were very... Is that because it's liminal space between like water, air, and earth or something like that? You know, it's uh, probably, I mean, I know the earth has a lot to do with it. And, and there were certain um, rules related, again, to the bathhouse, like you never wanted to build your house over the site of a, a former bathhouse. Um, but this was also the place that that individuals who wanted to learn sorcery and witchcraft would go because it was there as a liminal space. There was more easy access to the other world, um, to the spirit world. This is also where women um, would go to give birth. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is just like how Golden Rec Center is a big school of witchcraft and uh, midwifery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, um, and uh, anyway, so and that had to do also with the belief that the spirit of the child was lingering nearby and it had easier access into its body um, in the bathhouse. But it was a really, really, um, you know, frightening, dangerous space. You might wonder why, why did they take baths there? But yeah. um, also that was the one place where, where they would remove their two, um, you know, strongest the symbols of protection, their, their cross and, and the belt, which was supposed mm. to um, to keep them safe from demonic beings. So, um, so it's kind of a long way to, <laughs> to explain how it's, it's kind of at least interesting. I don't know if it's really useful, but it's at least interesting to know something of the folk belief um, in reading this kind of literature. And even Tolstoy in, in War and Peace, you, you find a little bit of it, not quite so much, but, um, but that, that's always been just tremendous interest to me, um, and then the the Nordic piece really came into place when I first taught uh, Tolkien's Nordic sources, and and prior to that time, I, I did not have a, a very extensive knowledge of um, of Norse mythology, but I learned quite a bit. And, and and I will just add also that 
um, it's what I find maybe most interesting is is the lack of of any real commonality in folk belief, mm -hmm. considering the role, which is still debated, of the Scandinavian Vikings in the just the founding of the early Russian state. I mean, they they have nothing in common with their gods. Their fairy tales you don't find elves, you don't find giants. Um, let's see the there 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 were a handful of of pagan um, gods that the the Slavs worship, but one of them has some similarities to Thor. Um, but the language that the names of these gods derive probably from Iranian um, sources. So I, I find that very very interesting that that there's such a dearth of um, of uh, you know shared. Uh, beliefs between the two peoples, considering, I mean, we know archaeologically and through primary sources that that the, the Vikings were in Russia, you know. Can I ask a question about that then? Yeah. Because um, I do see some commonalities, like there's the figure of the Domovoy, which if you want to talk about that for folks, please do, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of similar to Scandinavian folklore's Nissa, right? Kind of this little household figure uh, that you're supposed to treat in particular ways, right? And they'll do favors for you, or they'll kind of harass you depending uh, on how well you treat them. Like that always struck me as kind of like the Domovoy. I see that. So, and I, 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 I don't know a lot about the news. I'm familiar with it somewhat, but are there like was it believed to be like an ancestral spirit? Because that that's never explicitly stated. Okay, because that that might be a slight difference. Is the domovoy of all the the so-called minor deities, the the domestic and nature spirits that the Russians recognized? That was the only one that wasn't considered unclean, hmm. um, and that was believed to be uh, the spirit of an ancestor that had passed, uh, and was now the the primary function of the domovoy was to oversee the proper functioning of the household, uh, hmm. and it would punish. Um, for like if the dishes were left out, I might break them. If 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 a woman's um, you know spinning wasn't put away or um, or her you know her her work basically, then it could make a mess out of it. Uh, so it's it is I don't know even that I go so far as call it a trickster uh, figure, but but basically it just helped to ensure that people played their proper roles um, within the the household. But it was one that was not feared. In fact, there were. Um, that were, there were rituals involved in ensuring that your doma voice stayed with you. Uh, and so if you moved house, you would take um, some of the, just the ash from the stove, uh, which was central to the Russian um, household, and then it, it knew it was invited and you wanted to keep it with you because it was a protective figure um, and not something to be to be feared. But what are the, um, what are the sources available for Russian folklore principally? I mean, I know uh, some of this is, has got to be oral tradition that got collected pretty late, mm -hmm. right? Um, but is some of it kind of tied in with practices and customs of like the old believers or uh, where, where do we get these, these stories and, and, and then the folklore? Okay, it, it might, it kind of depends in part on, on what aspect of the folk belief um, and practices that you're looking at. Um, because for example, when it comes to just the the pagan gods of the early Slavs, the the the, the one the, the best source we have is actually Russia's uh, primary chronicle, mm -hmm. which was written in the early um, early what 12th century, and it and it, it is describing events about 250 years earlier than it was written, um, but it identifies you know five principal gods um, to whom there were idols erected by Prince Vladimir, uh, and then it mentions one other, um, but it, it just names names. And, and we do know that there were treaties uh, between the Kievan princes and Byzantium where uh, the, the, the Rus uh, signed, um, they, they basically made their pledge in the name of their god Prun uh, who was then recognized as a as a war god, but probably also was a a god of thunder, and hence the the little bit of <laughs> for uh, reference. Um, and we know a, a god named Volus was we know 
um, was uh, like a protector of cattle and, and probably the merchant class. But largely these are just names. And, and we get some of those names again in documents that were written after the, after the adoption of Christianity in Russia, uh, in sermons and as questions that were asked of, um, of in, in confessions, like, have you made offerings to these gods and, oh, and whatnot? But there's, there's very little information. And then you see the same works used by other people. So it gives the misconception of there being an abundance right. um, of information when there's actually very little, but- That's so much like English or Irish. Mm -hmm. too yeah where you're just you're, you're dealing with so few sources that get magnified by everybody kind of building on recording and quoting and quoting the same thing right and then it seems yeah. like there's an abundance and yeah, in fact yeah. there's there's very little but um but as far as the you know the, these other minor leaders they, they, they seem to have lasted well honestly even into present at times um uh you okay well i i have occasionally encountered an, an article about like psych sightings of the Rusalka, which was a, a, a water spirit of the Domovoy. Um, so they just kind of the, the uh, recognition of them and, and their, their functions to an extent in, in the lives of, of even contemporary Russians um, is still very much there. But, um, but you're right, most of like we have just different memorets, you know, where, where individuals, um, their words were recorded where Maybe they didn't experience an encounter with the Leshy, which is a, a forest spirit, but they knew someone who had it. It sounds a little bit like our modern urban <laughs> legends, right? But they believed in, in those legends. And, and those were largely gathered um, right at the, the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And then of course, it's a completely different story uh, after the revolution where um, every kind of belief, be it Christian or, or, or pagan, um, residual was 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 very actively um, suppressed, and in fact, the whole um, you know the, the Soviet government created new holidays <laughs> that that were that were acceptable um, when the people had their old traditions and, and old beliefs taken away. It's more rational, right? We uh, we got <laughs> a question here. Kind of reminds me we were talking about Ilya Muromets. Huh. Um, Lorianne asks, dragons seem to be a common theme among folklore. Evolutionary biologists found that our fear of predators can start as toddlers. Among adults, eye tracking studies show dangerous animals capture and attain our visual attention. Dragons are a combination of all the things we're afraid of. Talons from birds of prey, claws from big cats and bears, and fangs from snakes are all parts of dragons. Can you tell us how this fear crosses different folklore? Wow. <laughs> and I'm not sure that I, that I can't. Um, there, I will do my best here. So dragons do not appear, I'm trying to think if there's an exception, um, really in popular belief in, in Russia. Uh, you find dragons in the epics, which were medieval songs, um, actually. They're, they're, they're very, very interesting. Uh, they date back, at least the content of them they, dates them back to Kievan Rus, which is very distant. Um, and so, and, and, and actually in, in the epics, they tend, they tend to be um, anthropomorphized as Tartar Khans. Huh. Um, and even some of their names um, is, can be linked to the names of some of the Khans. Oh, and so the, uh, I mean, the, the Mongol Tartar invasion occupation of Russia was a major, major event mm -hmm. in its history. Um, and, and many of the epics uh, deal with the invasion uh, and with the defeat of these vast Mongol armies by great Russian heroes. And, and the, these epics, they're national, uh, they tend to be very, very positive. And so we, we were talking about a, a, a an epic here in Amelia Mermetz, whose holy remains I've seen. He's in the Caves Monastery in Kiev. Possibly the same guy. It's it's quite interesting. But um, let me see. You know, he uh, he defeats a a, a Mongol Khan um, named, by the name of Kalin, and and that's been associated with uh, with like one of the first confrontations between Russians and, and the Mongols um, of the Kalka River. Um, but, 
And he has a story with the son that's a lot like the Hildebrand, Hildebrand story in Germanic. And he doesn't recognize his son. Yeah. 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 And they do fight. And then he knows him, I think, because of a ring. It's a lot I'm like the forgetting. Hildebrand, Hildebrand story. Yeah. And, so, and, you know, it's, I, I think that with the epics, they're absolutely not sagas. They're completely different from, from sagas um, in, in, in form, at least in form. Um, but maybe not quite so much in, in, in content, except to say that Ily Mermetz, yeah, seems to have been a real person. In fact, a anthropologist studied his remains back in the 80s and found that um, in parallel to one of the epics of his early life, he did apparently suffer from some debilitating um, ailment. And in the, in the epic, of course, he's miraculously cured. Um, and goes on to be a um, a great warrior, um, but this this man who died in the caves monastery is a holy man. Uh, his remains show evidence of all kinds of battle scars, um, and then yeah, and then two of the other most famous of the epic warriors called Bogatirs, uh, Royal Yasha Popovich and Dubrinin Nikitich, and they also appear in historical chronicles, and so they also seem to have been real people. Prince Vladimir, who was the, the, the Kievan prince who adopted formally Christianity, uh, he also appears in, in the epics, and, and they're absolutely wrong in terms of their chronology, right? Um, so Vladimir appears in these epics. He died long before the Mongol invasion, but, but they're still, they're very interesting, and, and it's hard to know. I mean, obviously, that as a, as a strictly oral tradition, which was believed to have died out, and then it was discovered by this this fellow named Ribakov, who got in trouble with the czar and was sent to the far north to take a census. He overheard some fishermen singing these songs, and he realized he was listening to um, an epic about um, you know one of the, one of the Novorodian uh, princes, and and then there was all this excitement that oh they're still alive, and but it, it's and I realize I'm kind of going all over the place here, but um, but it was so ex exciting and a huge mystery to understand and try to figure out how the epics which originated in like 10th century Kiev right. made it to the far northern you know right. uh, and, and there you know parts of Russia and, and there there's there's speculation which which also makes a lot of sense but getting back to the dragons dragons you, you find them in you know kind of al allegorically and in, in the epics and then you find them in the fairy tales but but that's really the extent of it. And everybody understood that fairy tales were, um, were not real. Um, I will add though, that there is um, a relationship between the concept of, of the snake and the dragon. And etymologically, the, the words are, are very similar. Um, and the snake of course is, is related back to the devil. Um, and, and, and so there, I mean, etymologically there, there, there does seem to be that relationship, but, but, you really don't find dragons. And I know you weren't just asking about, asking about dragons. There are lots of other frightening creatures. Well, so it's also interesting, the distinction you're drawing here between the epics and then mm -hmm. folklore and then fairy tales is all three different things. Yes. And I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. Scholars often do draw pretty clear definitions around these. Whereas in popular literature, these things get mixed up a lot, mm. right? Could you give us a, condensed like sort of delineation between these what what you mean when you're talking about folk tales versus what you, what you're talking okay. about with, with folk tales versus fairy tales right um so well and actually so we're talking about folk tales and and i know that some define them somewhat differently but um but like folklore in in my understanding of it is like basically the the some total beliefs and rituals of of a people um, but they're real beliefs, uh, and uh, and that would include certain types of folk tales, like like legends, which uh, generally are about um, like Christian personages, like Saint Elijah and Saint Nicholas, and, and you find quite a few of those in um, among Russian folk tales. Uh, but the fairy tales, there there was a lot of work done to analyze them in the 20th century by a fellow by the name of Vladimir Krop, um, who recognized that that Russian quest tales follow a very, very specific pattern. 
um, and no other type of um, oral narrative follows the, the same pattern. And so just in, in terms of the structure of the different um, you know, types of, of oral narrative, they're very different. And, and same with the, um, the, the epics. I, I, I teach them, I created a whole course in the Russian epic and I, I think students might've thought I was just going to teach like war and peace and really, really long novels. Right, because right. They, epic means long, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. and yeah. Like, they're not necessarily long. Um, but uh, uh, in any case, there there is a significant amount of repetition and, and that probably had to do with the fact that they were so long and that was mm -hmm. like the repetition, the verbatim repetition. And I, I do find that students sometimes see this is tedious. <laughs> Um, it's 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 a mnemonic device, right? So so the tellers of the tales can be thinking about what's coming next as they're reciting verbatim, you know these these lines um, yeah, that occur over and over again. It's funny because we're encountering it as uh, an audience on a written page, but we have yeah. to think about it from the perspective of a producer of it orally. Yeah. Right. So we have to switch not only the medium but also what this, and then we can understand how that how how the repetition is actually useful. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I always I always try to emphasize the orality of, of these works, even with fairy tales. And I encourage my students to read them out loud. It's like they, they weren't meant to be read on a you know on, on a page and and uh, you know it's 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 somehow a difficult concept sometimes, but they and they weren't just they weren't read, right? They were orally really performed. They were they were kind of mini performances and and of course there's variation. Um in written versions of different of the fairy tales and, and even of, of the epics. And so um, like Ivan, or uh, Ilya Mermets and the Khanzar, I think it's been recorded something like 117 different times, meaning there were 117 okay. different versions that were recorded um, in the second half of the 19th century um, related to that. So, so, so folklore, yeah, it's, 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 it's the beliefs and, and rituals and, and in, in Russia, this had a lot to do partly just with agriculture, you know, a lot of ritual related to agriculture because Russia, if you didn't know, is <laughs> not the best place for, for agriculture, um, but also ancestor worship. And so there's this whole cult of the dead, which is also, you know, you don't, you can find evidence of it in, in some of the some of the fairy tales, but fairy tales are entirely a suspension of, of, of disbelief. Um, but, <laughs> On the other hand, you can find evidence of folk belief in, in some of the fairy tales. Okay, um, sure. And so one of my favorite fairy tales is Vastas of the Beautiful, and I, I teach it right after we've spent some time on traditional folk belief related to like the wind and earth and fire and water, um, because there, there's so much related to the, the witch Baba Yaga that kind of recalls um, not only beliefs related to the the natural elements, but also um, to ancestral worship, where Vasilisa has this doll that her mother gave to her, and and it speaks and it eats, and it's really creepy, but it's it's a, it's hmm. a fun, and <laughs> wonderful yeah, the, the story. The way things will eat and do stuff and talk strikes me as more Slavic and, and kind of Finnish. You see some of that in the Kalabala, mm -hmm. and, and and Stella was remarking about kind of some of the similarities about bathhouse lore to to Finnish sauna folklore. But it's something that's actually pretty different from the Norse world where you don't have mm -hmm. stuff that talks as much. And when it does, it's kind of a like, strikingly weird. Like it's, <laughs> it's um, anyway, just just a, a remark. And, and I, I wanna get to a question here in a moment, but let me also see if I can get your response to a hot take that I have about orality, which is that the closest people get to oral composition today is when they are lying. <laughs> and they right. have to think on their feet yeah. and recall what they said before yeah, and make right. it as accurate as possible. I think when you're that making really up, interesting. Yeah, when you're making up an elaborate lie, right. let's say a student is explaining why you know the homework <laughs> didn't get done or whatever, yeah. that's actually a great example of somewhat traditional oral uh oral composition, right? You've got some formulae <laughs> yeah. right, that, that that tend to recur, some tropes that tend to recur, but also people are uh they're, they're kind of summoning this from like this fund of, of common phraseology. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's, that's my hot take. Yeah. Oh, I like it. I like or it. Or John, John Phillips is or improv comedy. I think that, yeah, that could be similar too. <laughs> it depends, it depends that's... probably on your improv. Right. <laughs> some some are probably more original. Than yeah. Well, that's pretty funny. Anyway, it's a hot take. <laughs> 
Uh, Nero says, what allegory is attached to bears in Celtic mythology? Like the bear in the sky that eats the world but escapes, kind of like Fenrir. Oh, bears. Um, yeah, so so bears, there are a lot of folk beliefs attached to, to bears in um, Slavic mythology. And in part, it might be because of the fact that to all evidence, bears were swallowed by the earth in the fall and were reborn from it in the spring. Interesting. Yeah. And so the, the fact of, of their hibernation probably had a lot to do with it. And and the earth is a highly venerated substance in, in, in Russian mythology, all kinds of um, prohibitions and, and which are related to the earth and the sanctity of, of the earth. Um, but also the fact that bears, and I realize other creatures like squirrels, your, your favorite, um, can walk on their, well, they can sit up at least on their hind legs, but, yeah. but the fact that bears can move about on their hind legs, well, that's that, terrifying. I believe it. I've never, <laughs> never seen it in, in real life, but um, that, that it seems to suggest that there is a common like human history with, with the bear. Um, and some other... Doesn't that guy in the Moroska story get turned into a bear? He does, yeah. right? Because he's rude. Um, yeah, that's that's a different he's kind of thing. He's a mushroom guy. He is rude to the mushroom guy. And <laughs> he has to learn to be kind, right? By carrying the old woman around. That's yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of weird stuff. In, so in why that. is it a punishment yeah. to become a bear? I don't know. Right, but it makes I'm... sense because he goes from being a man to being to being a bear. But but even even beyond those kind of obvious things, um, I mean, bears are the only animals in Russian fairy tales that are offered as grooms for women, and that might hmm. reflect some past practice of human sacrifices, like sacrificing maidens to to bears. Oh. But also um when bears were killed they they were their their bodies were, were treated differently usually like they'd be skinned outside of the home but then their their pelt would be brought in it was brought in through a window huh. and then if it was removed it was removed through the window only human corpses were ever treated like that and it's based on this this kind of expectation that under certain circumstances, those that have died can return um, and do harm to the living. And so you don't bring them through the door. The door's open and closed all the time. It, it can just come in. The window's not like not so likely to be open. Um, That's something like the Aftergang in Norse, in Norse belief, too. You don't take yeah. a person you're afraid is going to come back as one of these Aftergang through the door. You yeah. knock out a hole in the wall and you take them out through that. <laughs> And that actually is is how sorcerers in, in Russia were sometimes treated. It's like you put a build a make a hole in the wall and take or the roof and, and take them up that way. And and sorcerers were among those that were believed always to return. It's like they they were just they were in, in Russia and there were a handful of words for vampires and one of them is heretic. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were non-orthodox, if you were Catholic, then you were heretic, and you could become a vampire when you die. Anyways, I believe whole, the whole persons whole of the Trinity different. are three different beings. So <laughs> I will come back to haunt you. Topic. But but back to the bears. Um, even even into the 20th century, if somebody had killed a bear, they it was common practice to cut off its paw and hang it above the the door into the barn, and and that was <laughs> to protect the animals in, inside and. And I, but but bears were were treated with reverence and tremendous respect in, in a ways that a way that other animals simply were not. And uh, one of my favorite little fairy tales, Russian fairy tales, if you've never read them, are, are sometimes surprisingly like violent and, and graphic and and just. What's a good kind English of language uh, work you could recommend? The Afanasyev text, the Russian fairy tales. Okay. You can grab it and show them. But um, but in in this little folk tale, a man. Goes to the woods. Oh, it's backwards, but um, Alexander Afan so oh, okay. Afanasyev um, is the editor. So yeah, just Russian fairy tales. It's it's good, and it has a, it's like a sampling of everything. You know, tales of everyday life, animal tales, quest tales. Um, Here, I'll type this. Afanasyev. Okay, and I'm gonna keep talking. So anyway, in this in this little folk tale. A peasant goes into the woods to collect wood and encounters a bear. 
and he gets into a fight with it with his axe that's all he's got and whacks off its hand its paw and the bear runs away into the woods and the man brings the paw back to his wife and instead of like burying it or hanging it on his barn he gives it to her she plucks out the fur and she puts it in the stew and the bear and i've heard bear meat is really bad <laughs> i've never tasted it but in any case it depends what the bear last day <laughs> The, the the peasant uh sorry so everything is fine um the bear meanwhile is is in is in the woods and he finds just picks up a stick and gives himself this kind of club hand and goes to find that peasant and and <laughs> the and the peasant can hear him like approaching the house and he's terrified and so he and his wife both both go to hide or try to find a place to hide in in their hut and the bear comes in and he finds the old man um, and he eats him and he finds a woman and he eats her. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> and, okay. and then there are other stories kind of like that that simply don't end well. Um, but that one, I mean, it's of particular interest because of the, the, just the simple fact that the bear was not shown the, the proper respect that it should right. have had. So anyway, that, that's a fun one. That one in the, the fox position were the... Well, and like a human being, <laughs> reacts to that lack of respect that's yeah. well maybe not i don't know that i would eat somebody from that <laughs> but anyway yeah. so yeah bears are bears are quite uh interesting in, in popular uh, belief norbert asked whether we know if sonic paganism might have uh, included worship of the sun or moon so not so much worship of the sun and the moon but there were a couple of pagan gods um, again, there's just not a whole lot that's known about them that were elemental, that were um, associated with um, like the, the, the sunlight. Um, but as far as like actual moon and sun worship, not really so much. You, you have like Perun, <laughs> Perun the, the, the god that I've mentioned, who was the, the god of war as well as uh, thunder and lightning. When... I'm going to back up just a moment. So Prince Vladimir is the one who adopted Christianity for, for Russia, for his people. But in, that was 988. Eight years prior to that, in 980, he adopted paganism as the official religion for his people. And it may have been done simply to, you know, to, to give a, a common basis of, of belief for all of his people. Um, the nature of Kiev and Rus was that it was it was very much a cultural crossroads. There were people trading across it, you know, from all different countries, and, and it may be that this was a way to um, unify all the people. And then he quickly realized that everyone else was turning to some kind of monotheism, um, and so he adopted Eastern Orthodox Christianity instead. Um, and of course, it you know he he demanded you know required the the baptism in the Dnieper of all the people of. Yeah, but it, it took a much longer to reach, you know, as okay. you would expect the, the rest of the of the people. Um, but the the needs of the people, again, primarily agricultural, did not change, even though they they were no longer permitted to worship these gods that you know brought the the, the sunshine and, and brought the rain at the at the right times. Um, and so what they did is they transferred some of those functions onto Christian. Um, personages. And so St. Elijah seems to have taken on the function of, um, of prune, which kind of makes sense to me if you, if you know the story of St. Elijah from, um, from the Old Testament, because he's the one who, well, he announced the coming of the drought, but he also was able to, you know, ask God to, to pour rain, you know, the fire on, on, his, on the altar, right, to, to prove his, his strength. So he brought fire and then also he announced the end of the drought, right, which was the rain. But in any case, and so they continue, and, and the, in the popular imagination, the saints were just, they still called them gods. <laughs> but now they had icons of them in their, in their homes. And um, so that was, um, that was acceptable. But so now it's St. Elijah that rides across the sky right. in his fiery chariot because, you know, he, he didn't die. He was taken to, to heaven and he sends down the, the lightning and, and, and the rain and, and, and the thunder. So, so you have spirits in the sky. Um, and it does seem that, that I know there, there are some beliefs related to the moon, like um, old sayings about the werewolf eating the moon, and that's why it gets larger, smaller, but specific veneration of the sun and, and moon 
um, is not is not so evident. Well, it's similar to in the Norse world, where there's a surprisingly small amount of stories related to the heavenly bodies, at least that we know. Oh. Although one of them, of course, is a wolf eating the moon, so that's kind of a neat, uh, a neat shared thing. So there's that. Yeah. Um, uh, Robin Campbell asks, uh, what role did the I'm going to say this wrong. Book, book, book. Said fun. The <laughs> I can do it, but I wasn't Russian quite sure culture and folk right. believe a livelihood in the 19th century. So, so the Volk. This is a fun word. Um, one of the epics is about a hero by the name of Volk Vaslavovich, um, and when you put Volk with Vaslavovich, you get Volk, and he was he could shape shift, and he. I won't go into all of the details, but he was apparently fathered by by a dragon. So there's another role for a dragon in the epic. But um, but he he learned a lot of hyperbole. Like when he was an hour and a half old, he demanded this massive mace and armor and helmet and and. But he was he was taught um, certain skills, and they included shape shifting. Like they were all shape <laughs> shape shifting. Um, but the so the in the word like the word of Volk is wolf um and Volks they were they were recognized as the like pagan priests magicians like they were kind of the forerunners of later sorcerers and and witches um i believe that that they're still around at the end of the 19th century um i haven't encountered a uh, specific reference to them and I think you know their, their functions were were kind of taken over by what was called the the, the Kuldun, um, which was a, a sorcerer the Adadis or the Admaz of witch. Um, but you know they're 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 pagan, and so I think just by definition they're they kind of go away. But but they they were those that people would turn to in times of drought because drought in in Russia, particularly if you had two or three years in a row of drought um, led to massive deaths, you know, famine and, and death. And, and so they would go to the Volk um, for help in those kinds of, of, of troubles. Um, and also they had the ability to, to foresee the future. And I know if you're familiar at all with the, the story of, um, it's Oleg, right, who, who I, I saw a reference to him as Oleg the Seer, but he went to to a Volk to learn his destiny and learned. We had we talked about this once because right. there's a similar story. It's just story. like uh, Arrowod and and Arrowod saga, right? Yeah, he's going to live 300 years, but then he's going to come back to the farm he grew up on. He's going to stumble on a horse bone and die. Okay, right? and so he kills the horse, thinking no, he's he's told he's going to be killed by the horse. Right, in 300 years, so he kills the horse. What ends up happening is he comes back 300 years later, trips on the horse's bones, and that's why he does. Yeah. Why 300 years? Oli didn't get 300 years, but wow. but otherwise, you know, those both told him um, as a prophecy, you know, that that he would die by his horse, and so he just pastured him. Like I'll just put the horse to pasture, and Pushkin wrote a wonderful poem about it. Um, and then same thing, you know, years later went back to find out what happened to it. Oh, it died, and it's like ah, oh, that idiot, you know, both I could have been riding my horse and. And then he kicks its skull, and a snake comes out and bites him. He dies. So yep, that's actually exactly what happens in Iran. <laughs> yeah, it's, he he trips he trips on the skull, and then the snake comes out and bites him. Yeah. yeah. So so there's that. <laughs> yeah, that obviously that obviously was borrowed from one or the other. That's so yeah. specific. Yeah. yeah. And it will. And this is a bit of an aside, but but borrowings they happen all the time, and they're so interesting to me as well. But the one of the like the the first um, woman ruler in Kibben Rus um, was Olga. Uh, and she was the wife um, of Prince Igor, who was murdered. And she exacted this wonderful revenge um, against his murderers. And one, and again, it, it's a little over the top, um, but one part of that involves strapping burning bits of tinder to sparrows' feet and then having them fly over the town and they land on the roofs and then set the whole town on fire. Um, but that same story is told about, um, oh, Chinggis Khan. Um, and then there's some stories told about Ivan the Terrible that are also told about Vlad the Impaler. And so it's, it's, it's interesting 
that actually how that happens. To a question right there, John Daly asks, uh, it's easy for us as Westerners to spot Christian or Norse connections. Are there any obvious influences you see from Turkic or other peoples across Asia? That, oh. that seems to dovetail that's, right into that. Yeah, and that, that's kind of my limited <laughs> um, you know, knowledge of, of that, but but I, I guess, and so, so Vlad was in Wallachia. Um, but well, and here I think we can, the connection might be more obvious in, in the fact that, you know, Vlad the Impaler lived about a century before um, Evan the Terrible, but there, there was a collection of stories about him that had been um, collected. And there was a copy of that in Ivan the Terrible's um, library. I'm not sure, you know, you don't know where stories start. Um, he didn't impale. Well, no, he had lots of different kinds of tortures, but he didn't impale on the scale. I'm thinking more of another story. We had people go out in their Easter best and build him up like a wall around one of his, you know, fortresses. But anyway, so yeah, it seems like there, there well, there's a bit, but I, I don't know as much about it. You also mentioned early on, uh, this may kind of connect to this question about some of these deities having some Iranian influence. And people forget that there is a, a linguistic border there mm -hmm. that's very immediate between Slavic and Iranian, because Iranian languages used to be spoken out on the steppe, like the right. Sibians and the Alans. Right, right. Like that. Uh, is, there, is there some noticeable early Slavic Iranian connection? I mean, the word for God is an interesting connection, right? The, that bog, bog word actually comes from Iranian, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there other? Well, so again, looking at the names of, of the gods, very few of them are evidently Slavic. And That's very there, interesting those, in itself. Um, like Dajbog, which is now famous coffee. Right. <laughs> um, it's, it, what does it's, that mean? <laughs> it, so it, it probably derives from the verb dot, which is to give. Um, and so the expectation just based on the meaning of the name is that this was a God who was responsible for um, like the, you know, having a successful crop, right? So, so if, if you had an abundance, then Dajbog was the one who had given it to you. Um, Dajbog, there's... It's Chernobog who lives in Chicago. <laughs> Trindabog was not among those that was recognized by, by Vladimir. And it's just something else, though, while we're on that. Um, so it's impossible to know the extent to which the people actually worshipped the gods that Vladimir said, okay, these are your gods. Right, right, right. Uh, and it makes sense that he would have made Prune a god of war because the early Kievan Russian state was constantly at war, both with invading outsiders like the Pachanigs and, and um, Polity, but but also a lot of internal warfare. And that's, I mean, Vladimir <laughs> killed one of his brothers <laughs> to take the, the throne. And, and there was, you know, Sviatoslav, oh no, Sviatopolk the Damned, right, who killed his brothers Boris and Gleb to take the throne. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of makes sense. But, but it, it's hard to know the extent to which that translated to actual popular sure, yeah. um, practice. Always, always a huge question with so many of these ancient and medieval yeah. sources where you have like one person's take, right? Or some right. ruler's take, or, you know, because it can be hard to know if the ruler is trying to impose something that's actually not part of popular belief. Yeah, and so he just kind of decided, okay, these are the main guys, but Prune is is evidently, and I, I you know, I don't know any person, but um, Prune, the speculation is that's of um, Iranian origin, um, as well as, Oh, what's his name? The name Sumargal? is Margul. The name <laughs> is present in Lithuania and is uh, Perkinos. So, okay. So, I mean, it could, that doesn't necessarily rule it out being a borrowing. It could yeah. be a common Baltasavic borrow from Iranian. Right. And I'm trying to think of who else there, there was. Um, Mokosh probably comes from um, the word in Russian for moist, Mokri. That was the one female. Oh, it's a um, moist mother. Earth. Yeah, moist that's mother a, big, Earth. a big thing. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. And then she she seemed to have merged with St. Pierskib of Friday hmm. <laughs> in the Christian um, tradition. Um, but really, again, it's it's just the it's the names that suggest you know these other influences, and none of the names seems clearly derived from from the Scandinavian 
um, at all. And then, but of course, there's the word ruse, which there's uh, all kinds of debate over. Yeah. Probably the most common <laughs> is that it's related to ro, that it's from. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Ro, or is it? Yeah. Because like, yeah. it's Finnish rozi, which gets pretty close to a. Right. Word for was, wasn't rozi, wasn't that the Finnish name for Swede yeah. or something? It's, because, an old, it's like an old Swedish tribe. Okay, because I, as far at least you know, when when historian I read says there, there is no evidence of a Rus tribe, um, you know, among the Scandinavian Vikings, but, but the, the story I think the the story of Rurik coming and bringing the whole Rus to right. Russia, yeah, <laughs> that would be a big debate, but I believe it. I, I just think it was written in part to justify the fact. But 250 years later, the Rurik dynasty is still in power, and it will be until the early well, history you know, 17th justifies, century. History justifies the winners, right? Exactly. Uh, let's see. Robin asked how you spell Khaldun. That was one of the Khaldun. Um, so transliterated, just K O L D U N. Okay. Khaldun. Just like it sounds. Okay. Khaldunya is the female version of, of that. Uh, here's Martha asking, was there any veneration of Prophet Elisha since he had bears attack children for being rude? I guess, I guess based on the bear. <laughs> Elisha, he was like Elijah's companion. Um, if that's the Elisha I'm thinking of. <laughs> I don't know. But there are, I mean, there are lots more stories about bears related to um, like these holy people uh like saint sergius who he like could tame bears or something like that but yeah that i that i don't know <laughs> i could try to find out for you but i i haven't well haven't i guess if they like bears it. maybe an old testament figure who's got a bear on his side who gets some points yeah you know. maybe so uh john daly asks since you mentioned russian veneration of the earth and mongols uh their native worship of tangri involved a lot of earth and season related superstition like their notorious taboo against bathing and running water mm -hmm. it sounds pretty legit it does um i would i would add too though that like when the what the mongol tartar mongols wanted when they invaded was just tribute mm -hmm. and so even though they basically <laughs> defeated the entire, you know, world of Russia as it was at that time. And that's long before like Siberia and, and whatnot. Um, they like, they wreaked mass devastation of every major city except for Novgorod. Uh, and then they basically withdrew, they stopped short of Poland and evidently it had to do with the re -elect the election of a new Khan. Um, and then they withdrew to the city of Sarai, where their Khan lived. And um, and it seems, I mean, I, I'm not at all questioning that that connection, um, but they never, I know at the time of the invasion, uh, they, they were largely just pagan. Um, many of them um, adopted like the religions of the people that they defeated. Um, let me see. But in any case, they, they, they kind of granted permission to the princes to rule their principalities and that kind of thing. But they never really tried to enforce any kind of culture. They didn't try to enforce, you know, their religion, their um, their beliefs. I totally believe it happened, you know, even just as a matter of of, of course because they were there for so long. Sure. Um, but there's not probably a lot of really close interlacing of these people, right? Probably, no. Yeah, I think that's something we sometimes we lose a little bit of perspective about this because these people are interacting so long ago. We think, oh, these people A met people B, there must be some some deep connection that formed there. But we, we forget yeah. that even if you're in especially pretty hostile interaction with another people for a long time, it's not necessarily going to create a lot of back and forth, mm -hmm. right? I think people. Uh, for you know, example, maybe in this century would be uh, uh, the U.S. and Japan mm -hmm. in World War II. And it's a long period of interaction, but what came of that culturally, right? I mean, some servicemen come back saying stuff like "askosh," yeah, right, or "sayonara," <laughs> right. or "kamikaze" becomes kind of a word for like right. a suicidal well, move. But there's not, but there's not deep interlacing right, of cultures. Right, right, like bistro. 
the French bistros from Russian bistro, <laughs> which means okay. like quickly, <laughs> fast. Yeah. So words like like the word dengi for money. That's that that can't, that's of um, Mongolian derivation. Um, apparently, like census taking <laughs> or something. So I did that periodically to know how much tribute they should be collecting and and that kind of thing. But um, but really economic the economic um, impact was the longest lasting far more than any anything culture because up until the time that happened in 1237 like Kiev particularly Novgorod um, were at least equal or more advanced um, compared to any city in in Europe and and the the occupation um, put an end to that Russia missed the Renaissance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why Peter the Great comes along and says, well, we are so backwards <laughs> because he went to Europe and, and saw, yeah, things were very, so very different there. We got a shape. <laughs> I know, we got a shape. Well, that's, okay. So let me, let me throw this. <laughs> we have a lot of conversation well, about facial hair. It was, but that, that re, like we, we study the, the law code of Yaroslav. It was, he was one of the sons, very good ruler. Um, of Vladimir, and he compiled the first written law code in, in and there was still um, blood vengeance for murder. And so, and there's some speculation that maybe he, that, that maybe that's Nordic influence, like the Vergil, well, that you pay money if you don't have someone to go and kill the brother of, you know, the, the man who killed your husband or whatever. I don't know, that's so universal. Um, maybe so, but, but they, my students always struggle with the fact that um, the fine for injuring a man's beard or mustache is greater than for chopping off his finger. Damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, can't do the time, don't do the crime, but- That's they, probably true with some finger concerts in Red Rocks. I mean, jeez. <laughs> and I'm sure that's, yeah, so that always leads to some interesting conversations. And then it probably had to do with, it was an affront to a man's, you know, manliness, right? right, right. Um, but by the time you get to Peter the Great, it's a sign of his piety. And so you read accounts of these, and it was only the boyars, right? And not not the peasants of the clergy, but you know stories of these boyars shaving their beards so they can be buried with them. <laughs> like I had one. <laughs> wow, I think this metal has to do that today too. Yeah, <laughs> such a plan. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, all interesting. You know, you said the name Yaroslav, and that made me. Yeah. That made me look back at this question. Uh, Nero asked if the Iranian word for friend, Yar, carried over had significance in Slavic. Is that what's happening in Yaroslav? Is that that? Yaroslav, what would that be? You know, maybe it, it did not stay the, <laughs> the word for friend, um, because even at the time of like um, of Vladimir, you know, man kept a little prince usually would have his retinue and that was his drugina and that comes from the word drug, which is the word for friends. But I, yeah, I'm trying to think what Yaroslav would otherwise mean. Some of them like, you know, Sviatoslav, it's, you know, light of the Slavs. Vladimir is a ruler of the world, but, but that's possible. I don't think it's stayed. It's not, I can't think of any other words for friendship that, that derive from. Because Vlad is the same, I believe, as a, uh, from the same root as Norse bald, yeah. uh, English wield, right? Power, yeah. real power. Um, I think my favorite name though in Slavic is Medved, <laughs> right? It's honey, right? Yeah, well, and so, so here's something. So the, but, so Medved, it's the Ved part is also from the word Vedma, which is the word for witch. And oh, cool. it's, it originates from a verb that means to know. And so the bear is literally one who knows honey, not in an intellectual way, but <laughs> in, a, in a relationship kind of way. Um, and, and, and the defining quality of, of a witch in, in uh, Islamic belief was that they, they had knowledge. They, they had knowledge that the average person could not possibly well, have. That's the normal Norse word for magical too, is fjölkunnigur, much knowing. Okay. so. And that makes sense. So, so I, I just thought that was cool. It's the same. That's pretty rad. Yeah, he's the, <laughs> he's the, he's the mead wit. <laughs> I guess would be the cognizant. Um, That's not so cool. 
See, Robin asked, who is Baba, Baba Yaga? You said it differently. You say Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga. Yaga. Yeah. And what role does she play in Russian folk belief and how is she portrayed? Is this Baba Yaga? Oh, that is so much fun. You know, it's not, but I could, I could say that she is, but she's, that's actually Olga. Um, so, so you didn't ask me like how I got into all of this, but I was prepared with like my visual because this is the first book I ever ordered from Scholastic Press. Oh, extremely far, so. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ghost, a witch, and the goblin. Um, I was in second grade. The witch is Baba Yaga, which I pronounced as Baba Yaga because I didn't know any better. Um, boy, we spent a couple of weeks at Baba Yaga in my fairy tales class, but yeah, or she's. Or you could watch Jack Frost, the uh, <laughs> episode from and, her, and she's played by a man, right? Which is oh, really? about right. Yeah. I don't even notice that. <laughs> so Baba Yaga, to, to answer your question, right? She's, you know. The, the short answer is she's the, the, the scary witch from, from Russian fairy tales, but she's so much more than that. Um, and I will, again, refer to you to the story of Vasilis the Beautiful, which you can find in that Afanasyev text, um, because <laughs> uh, it gives the most description of like her, her living quarters and um, inside her house and, and her behavior. But also it suggests very clearly that she's not just a witch, although she always knows, right, why the hero or heroine has come to her. Um, but she's also evidently a nature goddess. And, and so she, she's a pretty complex figure. And there are lots of different ideas about even like the origin of her, of her name. Um, but she's, I mean, she's ugly. So you don't think of goddesses as, as that. Um, but she... I thought her name meant Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I just, I just shook my head. <laughs> she, it doesn't translate as boogeyman, just in case that's what you're wondering. Um, but she, <laughs> she could be, I mean, she, she could be used to frighten little children and she actually appears, she's in fairy tales and, and, you know, I, I mentioned prop and, and how he um, worked out a specific function of, of quest tales and, and there are roles that individual characters play. And her role in, in quest tales is specifically what he described as donor. Um, mm -hmm. So the hero or heroine encounters her, she gives them a test, they pass it, and they, the hero or heroine always passes it. But the thread is, if you fail, I will eat you, right? Um, and, and so she's, she's a cannibal witch. Um, she, and, and she, she controls the wind in Vasilisa the Beautiful, as Vasilisa is heading towards Baba Yaga's hut, she's passed by a black rider, a red rider, rider, a white rider. And later when she asks Baba Yaga who they are, she says, oh, that was my black night. That was my red dawn. That was my bright day. And they're hers, which suggests that she also controls, you know, the day, which suggests also the passing of time. Um, and she, decides if the hero here will live or die. She does cook people. Um, and so her, like her, her stove and, and Russian stoves were massive things, right? People sleep on them. That always confuses my students. Like there weren't burners, right? <laughs> <laughs> they were just great big clay things with pretty ceramic tiles if you could afford it. And, and they were warm and that's where the infirm and elderly would sleep or, or your guests if you were hoping to eat them. Um, and, and so she's always tricked, but it's just the same way he is in, in, in Mother's Cove. It's like, I don't know how to sit on a paddle. Yeah, <laughs> so right. like, oh, I'll show you how, right? That always works um, with Baba Yaga. But she also appears in, in what we would call cautionary tales, where again, a badly ended story um, has seven little girls left by their parents um, while they go into town and they for a week and and they instruct the girls to go find an old woman to watch over them like babysit and and they go to Baba Yaga <laughs> not knowing and and Baba Yaga says yeah I'll, I'll come and take care of you but will you cut your dog's head off okay <laughs> so they go home and cut the head off their dog and Baba Yaga comes and she eats all of them and that's the end of the story wow right? And Three I mean, dreams. And that's the reverse of the 2014 Baba Yaga story because they kill Baba Yaga's dog. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm pushing no, this too far. No. Like I, I saw a book called Baba Yaga, Baba Yaga Babushka, Babushka's just grandmother, where she meets, befriends, she's lonely. And so she goes into a village and befriends these little children and they, 
and it's really sappy. And I thought she was supposed to defend children. She's supposed to eat them. <laughs> but yeah, that's a severe. That's me. So that's, so that's anyway. That's a severe softening. <laughs> Well, and Estella says, actually, I, I thought about this too, although I don't know how to say it right. Is it oh, Kos, Koska? Uh, Katie, or what? Oh, sorry. When you look at it. Oh, Cache. Cache, yeah. the bony skeleton man. Yeah, he's a he's a sorcerer. And he's, yeah. So his name probably derives from Kos, which means bone. And and if you look at illustrations of him, like by Ivan Belieben, I would recommend. Go look up Ivan Belieben. It's wonderful. Late 19th century fairy tale illustrator. I can spell it. Oops, I can capitalize. Um, he's, it reminds me, I have to do two things at the same time. Believing. So, believing. Um, so, Mr. Smithers from The I Simpsons. Didn't this <laughs> very, I mean, there's there's one episode, it's been so long, and I'm sorry, I just pulled this out nowhere, where he's like naked, Marge paints him naked. That's what crochet kind of looks like. It's just very, that's believe in drawing of him wow, from behind, right? And and he's he's just <laughs> sorry, you can't like not get that out of your head now. Um, but what's ironic is he's always going for the beautiful princesses, and and in the fairy tales, he's like in relentless pursuit of these women, and he kidnaps them and then keeps them and as his as his wife, and the hero has to rescue her. But the the other thing, he's deathless, which is kind of a misnomer because he dies in all of his stories. But his death is outside his body, and so the usual place, write this down, is is in a an egg, in a duck, in a hair, in a coffer, on an under a tree, on an island in the middle of some unnamed ocean. And the hero has to find it, right? That's also where uh, where my tenure letter is. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> anyway, the hero manages, usually with the help of aquatic friends, um, to get it. Although there is one that's a little disappointing where the horse, um, the hero's horse, Crochet also has a, a special horse, but the hero gets a really special horse from Baba Yaga and it kicks Crochet in the head and that kills him. But it's the, I don't know when they started, they shrewd horses, right, for a long time. Because I think it's, it's, the, it's the metal, right? That's why metal pins were sometimes used for shaman, like shamanistic tools. Anyway, but that's cliche. I think it's cool. <laughs> it's but, but still, was mentioning cliche because, like, that would have actually been maybe a better thing to call. Oh, I thought of that too. Read. It was like, yeah. oh, that would have, but especially like in Russian, it's cliche is That would have been so good. Or cliche the immortal. But Baba Yaga. I mean, who didn't laugh? Who yeah, it's just knows, what people know. But... Just like in Norse, people know four. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, Roman I asked totally agree. So, so for the books, I like <laughs> the sun. You'll never the find hundred degree this. sun is right there. But the uh, fairy tale is in that same collection. It's yeah, just a different so, translation. So it's just called Baba Yaga. So when I put this publicly, I'll try to post better pictures of these. Okay, but that's like but, 1970 or something. It's very old. But you can find that same story in here. There are two different stories called Baba Yaga, but she appears in a number of, of stories and her role um, in that one, in the one in my book, she's not so much a tester because her plan is just to eat the girl, but the girl is shows kindness to the gate and the tree and the cat and they help her escape. Hmm. And then she's also got the chicken in the cows. Oh yeah, I didn't even get into those details, right? Because she's got the fence around the hut with the skulls, right? And there's always one that's empty and that's for the hero okay. if he fails. and Puts on chicken legs so it can move, and the hero has to know what to say to make it turn around. And yeah, she's <laughs> quite an interesting figure. Yeah. Again, the 1998 episode of Mystery Science Theater, Jack Frost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching it. I'll, I'll, I'll do it before classes start when I might still have time. <laughs> Some excellent source of information. <laughs> yeah. um, Very good. More I questions, know, or do you have really, more time? Really you, oh, I've, I've got, I've got time. We just had an hour here, so yeah. Maybe start wrapping things up. We don't have more questions. I think that blind works. I right? <laughs> lower. It's really bright right here. You can like shift. Nothing like works. We need to. But. It's, it's, it's campus. <laughs> uh, oh, Hellboy. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so has one, but maybe a big subject. Is that all right? Let me see. What is it? What's the meaning of life? <laughs> All right. Well, let's see it, and we'll yeah, decide if we've got so, time for it. So what do you want to see? Uh, Stella's so, question. 
which has not yet been asked. But let us see it, and we will decide if you've got time for it. Okay, sure. Now we it's wait with bated breath. Four. <laughs> I, I presume. I've read some about vampire lore from Poland, but is there any in Russia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I teach a, a whole it's course. A yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I wanted to create a course called Death, the Dead, and the Undead in Slavic Folk Belief, but the core curriculum committee says you can't call the class that. Oh, come on. <laughs> that class Plus, they, they don't consider folk lore or folk narrative literature. Isn't that ridiculous? So they went at three times, I mean, three times where they proved it after I added Dracula and all these a whole bunch of other... To make it literature? Yeah, isn't that lame? And Dracula's great, and I always bring in the folklore. It's like, so I got approval, and, and Mark, well, well, this Mark is... says, you can add that back. <laughs> can you say that in Mark's voice? But, no. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is like Billy Ray Cyrus having to record that part of, of that one song for... Little Nas X to get it into the Country Music Awards or whatever. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't spend a lot of time in popular culture. <laughs> but it's. <laughs> I spend so little time that my references are all pathetic, <laughs> and I and I drive them into the ground. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, Brian Lemley. You know what? I, I haven't read him. I know of him, and I keep thinking I should read that. So and I did take that vampire class long ago. Yeah. And actually during the vampire so so when I had that one credit left to get my degree and I took the vampire class to get it. Um, we read all this traditional vampire folklore. But then also we had a final project and for my final project I wrote a novel. You wrote a novel. I have actually written no joke 15 years ago, but I wrote a vampire novel. And she said it actually just had to be a short story, but I just yeah. kept going. I was on a roll, and I wrote a damn novel. You should send it to me. So no, I wrote. No one will ever see it. I wrote an Again. vampire short story, and it was so it was published in this literary journal where where I was a student, and uh, and I totally forgot about it until my daughter, who's now at the same school, found a copy of it and brought oh, it no. home. <laughs> and I thought this actually was pretty. It was pretty good, obviously influenced by a song by, by Sting from a very old album, but anyway. <laughs> well, mine did not actually have literal vampires. It had people who thought they were vampires. Oh. And the hero was a uh, historical linguist Oops. who specialized in like Morse. Um, yeah, mine, it's just eluded, right? It's just the ambiance, right? He doesn't actually attack anybody. Sorry, that's my mother. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but that so sorry, get back to your question. There's a lot. Um, and in fact, like the the one of the reasons I, I, I I'm convinced that vampires are so popular to this day is because of the first documented case that occurred in, in, in Serbia. Um, the so called Arnold Paul case and their various translation or spellings of Arnold Paul. But I can do my best here. Arnold Paul. Um, because it wasn't just him, but even like three years after he died, people were still dying um, and getting dug up. And, and so finally at that time, um, Serbia was under the rule of Austria. And so the Austrian Empress Maria, I think it was, um, sent her Surgeon General there to investigate what the heck was going on that all these bodies were being dug up. Surgeon General's and vampire his name investigation. Is Luckinger, which I always have to pronounce very carefully. <laughs> and he, and so he's, and not, a lot of his evidence actually was recorded by other people. Um, but he's awesome. like, this, these are vampires. Like there is no other explanation. He describes them being in the vampire condition. He publishes papers translated in every language. And then suddenly it's like, and then there were just more and more. And then it was, I guess it was Polidori, John Polidori who wrote the, wrote the first English vampire story. But I, that was what, it was published like in every science journal of the time as, a, as an actual attested case by General Fuckinger. Um, and there are others, but okay. So I have a really an, if you have a interesting book. A book. <laughs> uh, where is Paul, it? It's Paul Barber, it's on my vampire shelf. Paul Bar Barber. <laughs> Paul, oops, Paul Barber, um, Vampires, Burial, and Death. He also, if you don't want to read the whole book, he has an article called, I can't, 
I can confirm the Wizard Vampire Shell. <laughs> and Death, he also has an article, very interesting article, um, called The Forensic Pathology of the Vampire. Um, and this is kind of the book version of that article, but he looks at the physiology um, behind vampires. And it's a really interesting read. It's a little gruesome. Um, but he talks, you know, about why they are always described as having flesh, you know, fresh blood at their mouths and their nose. And it's like, well, it has to do with decomposition and the body. Especially when you stake it, oh, it made a noise. Well, that would be the air. <laughs> anyway, but really, it's a really interesting book that is not just um, Russian, but he does talk specifically about Eastern, Eastern Europe and, and Russian vampires about, you know, how they the kinds of people who became vampires. And anyway, it's really, if you're into that, I'm not into vampires, but I teach about them and I just find them interesting I, uh, from a folklore perspective. I just want to call out the uh, pull quote on the front, a splendid book about the undead. <laughs> you got <Okay>. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, did you find it? Thanks, Stella. Um, yeah. Stella so, is a magnificent find. That's great. So yeah, short answer and but we'll never find my secret vampire novel. <laughs> you didn't submit it for publication anywhere? Uh, no. Uh, no, I didn't. It was called, actually, I probably ought to not even say what it was called in my mail. <laughs> <laughs> <gonna> find it. <laughs> yeah. It's on the internet. It's uh, out there. Only three people ever read it besides me. Four people ever read it besides me, so I think it's pretty safe. <laughs> So anyway. Well, do you know there are vampire clubs in Denver? It's like they have vampire nights where where the vampire subculture can go and have a safe place to meet. What do they do? In Denver. I don't know, and I think that'd be a cool field trip. Yeah. With my, yeah. My students who are of age. Yeah. But I haven't kind of had the nerve to check them out myself. Vampire ball. But in my opinion, boy, if you haven't died and returned from the dead, then you're not a vampire. Yeah. There's like psychic vampires. I mean that's my bottom line. You know, I guess there's theories that I that that that's actually that I actually am some kind of revenant, um, <laughs> but that's a whole different subject. Yeah. So now I've got people calling for this being a new Patreon tier, right? You know, maybe fifteen dollars a month to get like one chapter of the Secret Vampire novel. <laughs> Only three other people have read it, and they all disappeared in a mysterious way. Well, two of them are dead. Actually, maybe three of them. Um, oh, that was well. that was a that was a nice morbid note. Um, <laughs> we have yeah. we have another minute for questions. If anybody's got something. Oh more. yeah, sure. This is this is fun. Yeah, I wasn't sure what we would be talking about, but it's kind of a little bit of everything. Yeah. Hey, well, that's what this practice is going to be. I mean, you've yeah. been on the other end of it. Mm -hmm. All the right. Omaha so, God. The Omaha God. Oh, is it is a gust? I don't think I've ever been anything you could describe as a ball. That's <laughs> yeah. Me either. Going story. back to storytelling being lying. Uh, arguably any vampire novel now released online with your name would be a true vampire novel. Oh god. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean that's pretty much why I leave Star Wars as an Icelandic saga up. It's because I know that if I took it down, it would be somewhere else that I wouldn't be in control. Right. Right. So maybe that's yeah. actually a decent argument. Thanks, Stella. Go. Thanks for putting that out there. <laughs> maybe uh, everybody needs like a secret code word. Yeah. We'll distribute it to only a few people. It was before Twilight. It has that distinction. Okay. And you're not saying that because it has any similarities? No, okay, no. Good. I was just saying that it was yeah. uh, that, it, that it preceded the tropes that were <laughs> so good. Those, although what, what's interesting, like there is a really like, historical, historical, like folkloric relationship between vampires and werewolves, but like in most Slavic belief, like, it was the wolf thing. Is it? Well, if you like having having a werewolf around was good because it could protect you from, um, from from vampires. Huh. But the damp here, have you seen Blade? No, I've never seen. Blade. Oh man, you guys see Blade? Um, he's a damp here, and that was a real thing where he was like born. He, his, yeah, he's born of a, his what mother's, I'm forgetting the story, but his mother was bitten by a vampire when he was, when she was pregnant with him. And he can seek out and identify and destroy other vampires. And that was a real thing. Huh. But like okay. only so like twin siblings born on a full moon on whatever. <laughs> it was 
So that was actually I, okay. I that was a real thing. I figured that like I, I kind of knew of it by us cultural osmosis, right? I didn't realize that yeah. was actually a, a real folklore thing. A we never covered that thing. in my vampire class. We never watched Blade. We did read um, I'm Legend. Which yeah, is, which I did yeah, realize. which is way better than. Well, there's a there's a Vincent Price version that's based on the real novel and not the it's one with Price version. And a young is very badly cast, <laughs> <laughs> but it's way better than the Will Smith. I mean, I really like Will Smith. What about Charlton? But they totally changed the end. Oh, oh yeah, that's that's what was that one called? It was called yeah, it was called. Am I? Uh, Armag Armag what is no, it? it's called something different. I know, but, but I'm trying to remember what it was. Charlton, Armageddon Man. Charlton is, some, is the man. Oh no, I, I know. I, I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, but the, the Will Smith version this. changes changes the ending. I never saw the Will Smith version. Oh that's actually, yeah, don't. That, that's actually after my vampire. You class, can find so. the Vincent Price version on YouTube. Oh okay. Yeah, it's. Oh, the Omega Man. Yeah. It was Omega, Omega Man, Man, Armageddon. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's the Vincent Price. One. Wow. Yeah, it's but it, it's it's more faithful to. <laughs> The story. Lauren says, I was a science major. I feel like Alice looking through a glass. <laughs> so I started I started as pre vet. <laughs> huh. That was my other interest. I was going to be a large animal vet, and chemistry killed me. I was so always I, a use historic. I started as This was my other <laughs> first book. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we got to show people. <laughs> Has nothing to do with folk belief, but yeah, I was, I was looking, looking into equine medicine, but. I just like to dissect things so that was in earlier, earlier life. Chemistry is, it's rough. It is, I figure if I can't, three times I tried. <laughs> well, I uh, make biochem and organic chem. Martha says regarding the Serpian vampires, I wonder if there's a lot of TB around at the time. Might it be possible to resample those vampires' graves, check for evidence of the disease? <laughs> well, yeah. so it is true that most, van and the Barber book talks about this, it originates in disease because they didn't recognize how disease spread. Sure. And so like in, in Russia, it's like the, if, if, if there was evidence of a vampire, the first thing you do is dig up the person who most recently died and see what they look like. Um, but that, but usually the evidence was, well, this guy died and then his wife died and then his old mother died and then the neighbor died. So he's coming back for his is kind of the idea. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, well, his wife took care of him and caught it and his old mother took care of him and caught it. And his neighbor was there and she caught it, but they didn't recognize that. And they weren't right? wearing masks. They weren't wearing masks, right? And so all the more reason that we should do what we're supposed to do. So I saw a link to something there on, uh, on Blood TV. sucking disease, applying vampire superstition to the pa paleon paleopathology. My mom oh, still finds things. That's pretty cool. I'll have to look into that one. Yeah, my uh we never, we never really explored those, those science aspects of it in my vampire class, but I am always pointing this stuff up. You know, like, I, I guess when I was teaching this class, you know, around um, October, usually, <laughs> especially in the fall, if it was a fall semester, I always try to make, make it around Halloween. I just talk about the Aftergang oh, yeah. in, in Norse Math or the Sagas class. Um, and there's a lot of commonalities there, right? Because mm -hmm. he's kind of a bloated figure that has blood leaking out of the mouth and, right. and often described as blue. And all that sounds like decomposition in a cold. Yeah. Environment. Um, but it's a similar thing. They also come back for, for their own, right? Because the Ostraganga famously will often come back and, and, and like coitally engage with his wife. <laughs> Same in that. Russia. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that's a very sensitive way to put that. Yeah. Thank in you. Russia as well. <laughs> I, learned, I learned how to put it that sensitively <laughs> from a Russian. Um, so. Yes. So, yeah, that, that, that could happen. Yeah. It's interesting. And I can say more on that, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got to look up my my old vampire professor. I wonder how she's doing. Um, well, thank you very much for taking the time with us today. Oh, this is a great conversation. Fun. <laughs> great questions, great feedback. Yeah. Your audience. Thanks and, for the uh, questions. And now I know I need to uh, go and kill the other two people who read my vampire novel. <laughs> <laughs> or kill them again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, yeah. uh, I know there was one oh, hard yeah. copy, and I don't know where it is. 
All right. Yeah. So burning bodies. That was with the that was with the octagon. That was like the the way to get rid of them for good. Same in Russia. It's like if the aspen stake didn't work, then you cut off their head, burn their body, and aspen stake. Huh? That's interesting. Well, if, so it we're, is. We're fixed in Colorado. We are, and it's aspen because that was. I don't know where they got the information. That was the kind. That was the wood that Christ was crucified on. But then I That's read in England, it's oak because that was the wood that Jesus was crucified on. <laughs> yeah, so, there's no way it's in the New Testament. I think it's Aspen because they're, uh, yeah, there are lots of them in, in Russia. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then juniper is an important thing in Russia too, right? Yeah, I'm trying to think. More of the birch, like they make drink, you know, a beverage out of birch and they make birch bark shoes and birch bark everything it actually looks a lot like leather when it's <laughs> treated properly well thank you <sighs> one more time thank you folks for being with us today and uh i'll put this up on uh youtube later too and i'll try to get better pictures of these books than i was able to find <laughs> by just doing this actually well, the light's better now that, well but that one isn't really relevant to anything <laughs> well, except my, my early life and that one, good luck finding it. That's not the very copy. This is the original copy. That one I had to find on eBay because I lost mine somewhere. But. That's cool that you still have the old copy. I but, I don't know. I've got I've got some of my old childhood favorite books, but not too many of them. The Black Stallion series and Marguerite Henry. Folks, thank you again. And uh, well, from uh, CU campus in beautiful Colorado. <laughs> Wish you all the best. Thank you.